Our Debunking the Seven Myths program is designed for students 11th grade through college. This program addresses the seven leading myths about Genesis, creation, and the flood that are taught in today's colleges, even some Christian colleges. Myth number seven is dinosaurs died out millions of years ago, did not walk with man, and are not mentioned in the Bible. Many people have asked, where did dinosaurs fit into the biblical timeline? They don't. Dinosaurs are well outside of any human timeline. The biblical age of the earth is off by a factor of 753.9, meaning that to pretend as if the earth is only about 6,000 years old is like saying that New York is only three miles from Los Angeles. And what does the Bible say about dinosaurs? Not a damn thing, because the age of the dinosaurs ended long before people came along and made up their myths about gods and magic, and that was a couple thousand years before anyone figured out what fossils were. The various anonymous authors of the assorted scriptures obviously had no idea what had come in the many ages before they invented their different religions. These are folks who said that there is nothing new under the sun, not realizing that they themselves, humans, were a relatively new thing in a very ancient and ever-changing world. Yes, the Bible does mention dinosaurs, even specifically. That's actually true, surprisingly. The Bible does mention dinosaurs specifically many times throughout the Old and New Testaments. But the Bible doesn't recognize them as dinosaurs. It always only calls them birds instead. Because the simple people who wrote all those fables didn't know about any of the rest of the dinosaurs that were by then long extinct. Because the superstitious primitives who crafted their various creation myths didn't have the first clue about the distant past. They didn't know there was one. They thought the world had been created just for them like the day before. They thought that all life was poofed out of nothing by magic all at once by a very deceptive deity, essentially a genie-like character, who left all this misleading evidence everywhere indicating something else. They didn't know anything about taxonomy either, obviously. They thought that everything was either animal, mineral, or vegetable, and that all the animals could be divided into cattle and beasts, even though cattle are beasts, and birds, which included bats. And their fish category (laughs) includes both whales and lobsters. Everything else was put into the category of creeping things. A junk drawer for 99% of all eukaryote biomass, because they only knew about eukaryotes. And when they saw evidence of prokaryotes, they mistook it for magical curses. When it came to zoology, the biblical authors had absolutely no idea what they were talking about. Actually, they didn't know what they were talking about ever, no matter what the topic was. Remember that these people worship a book. They want the Bible to be the only source of truth in our world. Let everything else be a lie. So in their mind, only their lie is real and reality is a lie. That's why they assert their opinion as a matter of fact. And that's why they dismiss all the facts as if they're only opinions. Evolution isn't an opinion, it's fact. And that is your opinion. Everybody knows there are different families. And even you would say one of the, the um, categories is family. Yeah, and we are in the ape family. Specifically, we are in the, the great ape family. That's your opinion. Remember that a fact is a point of data that is objectively verifiable, in this case, simply by looking it up. But before we get there, let's take a quick look at the big picture. Evolution holds that dinosaurs evolved 220 million years ago and died about 65 million years ago from any of a number of possible extinction events. Actually, it was all of those events that we know really happened combined, and then some, because it's always something. If it's not one thing, it's another. Either it's a volcanic flood basalt eruption or it's cosmic destruction. What are you going to do? But the Bible teaches that all land animals, including dinosaurs, were created on the sixth day of creation, just thousands of years ago. And they were all named by Adam just before God handed over his completed creation to Adam and Eve, charging them to take dominion over his completed creation. Yes, way back before anyone knew any better, people made up lots of fanciful fables just as silly as the ones in the Bible, trying to explain things they didn't understand. In the Pacific Northwest, they said that Coyote carved the rivers and mountains and that he made all of the animals simply by wishing them into being, you know, the way gods do. In a Chinese creation myth, a giant hatched out of an egg in the sky, separating the earth from the rest of the cosmos. And this giant wanted these things to stay separate, So with his feet on the ground and his head against the firmament, because 
everyone in Asia believed in a firmament back then, he grew larger and larger, pushing the sky dome away from the land as he grew. Then when he was 30,000 miles tall, he died, and his blood became the rivers, and his arms and legs became the four directions. And some of these myths were even sillier than the Bible. For example, I read in one of the Indian creation myths, there was, in the beginning, absolutely nothing. Nothing but death and hunger, which were the same thing, anthropomorphized. So death and hunger decided to have a self, which it already had to have in order to make that decision. And then death, a hey, hey, hunger, created his own mind out of the conscious thoughts of his mind, which amounted to absolutely nothing. He then became a being of light, whose movement created water, and the foaming water created land. Then he divided himself into fire and air and the sun, before further dividing himself into the first couple, who were conceived together, embracing each other as one, engaged in the act of sex at the moment of their creation. All this so the dead hungry nothing wouldn't be so lonely. And my point is, there are lots of creation myths, and they're all obviously made up nonsense, just like what we read in Genesis. Then, about 4,400 years ago, the entire world was deluged by Noah's flood, and the dinosaurs, along with billions of other creatures, were wiped out. Lots of different cultures have flood myths, too, and they're all very different. The Chinese creation myth that I mentioned a moment ago goes on to say that a warrior climbed up a mountain in a fit of rage and threw his spear into the sky, punching a hole in the firmament, because remember, everybody in Asia believed in a firmament back then. And then the waters above the firmament flooded through the hole in the sky until the Naga goddess Nukwa had to fix the roof over the earth and clean up the mess. All these myths have the same failing. The authors didn't understand that natural processes in chemistry and so on can bring about certain effects automatically. Believers today still cannot conceive of patterns of emergent complexity. Instead, the myth-makers always imagine that the only way that something can happen is if someone somewhere decided that it should happen. They have this strange fixation with why things happen, not just cause and effect, but imagining that everything happens for a reason, by which they mean an intended purpose. Their literature always refers to notions like purpose-driven life, and the thing they object to the most is that anything should be random, and this excludes deterministic processes, which believers dismiss as being by chance. They don't understand that a process can be deterministic, that it's not random the way believers imagine. No, when they complain about things being random chance, they don't mean that it's actually random, because evolution, for example, isn't random at all. It's just that they want everything to be deliberately designed, as if everything is how it is because someone wanted it to be. A mystical father figure who loves us. They just can't accept that the universe is thoughtless and heartless and doesn't care about us at all. Let's take a quick look at some evidences that show that the biblical account might actually be true. But we know for certain that it's not true. We have proof that it's not true. From many different lines of evidence in each of several independent fields of science, as I explained in my eight-part series on how various fields of study all disprove the global flood fable of Noah's Ark. First, dinosaurs are cleverly designed. Consider this triceratops. Its 2,000-pound head is mounted in a way that allows it to turn every which way, yet still be strong enough to ram something, even while running. What about massive seropods with weight-bearing systems from hip to toe that allow its 200,000-pound body to even walk, and neck vertebrae that are 90% filled with air so it can lift up its head? Creationists like to talk about design, but they won't accept incidental design, as determined automatically by factors like natural selection, which computer models have shown that natural selection can actually exceed the capacity of intelligent designers. Believers think that if it's complex, it must have had a designer. But they don't understand that haphazard configurations of blind design arising from the molecular level will invariably be insanely complex and unnecessarily complex. They don't want anything to have a reason, not if it's just a cause. They want everything to be for a reason. They want there to be a meaning of life. And there just isn't one, nor need there be. But as I said, believers just can't accept that. Next, there's the absence of dinosaur ancestors and transitions. Even the Chicago Field Museum sign admits there have been zero transitions between dinosaur kinds. 
No, the Chicago Field Museum doesn't even mention kinds because there's no such thing as a kind. Nowhere do they say or in any way imply that there are zero transitions. I had to wonder why these apologists would say such a thing but not show an illustration that supports their claim or shows one that doesn't support their claim. So I looked into it to to see if they knew of an illustration like what they're talking about, but they don't. They would only show this as if it was that. (laughs) Of course, there are transitions in and for each of these groups, every one of them. For example, protoceratopsians and prosauropods, as well as intermediaries between stegosaurs and ankylosaurs. There are hundreds of species of dinosaurs, and if the graphic is detailed enough, those transitions will become obvious. This image, however, is too limited and too simplistic to show what creationists are asking for. That's probably why they chose it. You see, we don't draw a dendrogram as a linear chain, but as a branching tree, where all the transitions are depicted as side branches. Here's one I made myself just to illustrate a few of the many transitions that creationists seem unable or unwilling to see. It shows question marks regarding where they came from. No, it doesn't. It says common ancestor. And dendrograms and cladograms do not show common ancestors, and I'll tell you why, using my own much more detailed animated illustration to compare with the old grainy image from Genesis Apologetics. Creationists will say anything they want and be proven wrong immediately, and they'll just keep on saying the same thing tomorrow as if they'd never been refuted, because they have no accountability. But scientists do, and they have to maintain a reputation of credibility. So they want to be careful that whatever they say today is still true tomorrow, regardless of any new discoveries. For example, when Quarrymen discovered Archaeopteryx way back in 1861, the first transitional fossil predicted by Darwin himself, Folks back then said it was the common ancestor of all birds. But since then, we've found lots more transitions, some even closer to the origin of apes than Archie was. Being a transitional fossil does not mean that it's necessarily an ancestral species. A transitional fossil is one that looks like it's from an organism intermediate between two lineages, meaning that it has some characteristics of lineage A, some characteristics of lineage B, and probably some characteristics partway between the two. Transitional fossils can occur between groups of any taxonomic level, such as between species, between orders, etc. Ideally, the transitional fossil should be found stratigraphically between the first occurrence of the ancestral lineage and the first occurrence of the descendant lineage. And as you can see, everything on my animated illustrated list meets all those criteria. There are also a few transitional species that are potentially common ancestors of all dinosaurs, or dinosaurs and pterosaurs, or ornithodirons and crocodilomorphs. We have all of those and more. There are transitions everywhere throughout taxonomy, but of course they're not in this one dinky little picture with only a handful of thumbnails. So why does Genesis Apologetics show this question mark? Because they mislabeled it, and they lied about it pretending as if unnamed scientists who support evolution put those zeros there, when we know they certainly did not. Creationists put all those zeros there because they don't know how to read a dendrogram. And they still wouldn't read it right, even if they could, because the truth doesn't matter when you're trying to make believe something else instead. It's almost like someone just put each basic kind on Earth right at the same time. No, it's not like that at all. Instead, it's almost as if Creationists will tell any lie necessary in order to mislead and deceive believers. In fact, that's exactly what's happening here. That's what religious apologetics is all about. There are even dinosaur design features that show they lived in the ideal pre-flood world. And we're still living in a pre-flood world since no global flood has ever happened yet, nor could it, ever. So we don't have to worry about that. But it is true that one part of the Mesozoic era is considered ideal. Some paleontologists say that the indications are that the Jurassic period was the best time to be alive out of the whole of biological history. Being flanked on both sides by the Triassic and Cretaceous periods, both fraught with multiple extinction events, including the two biggest ones, the Jurassic period was like the eye of the storm, being really nice. And it it was a bit warmer than we are today, so there were no permanent ice caps at the poles. and consequently sea levels were much higher than they are now, enough that all of our coastal cities would be underwater. But there weren't any cities back then, so it doesn't matter. The world was a global tropical paradise, at least weather-wise. 
Otherwise, don't go swimming in it because lifeguards cannot save you. Pterodactyls may have been too heavy to fly in today's atmosphere. Their skeletons were hollow and extremely light, even lighter than that of birds. A pterosaur could have had the wingspan of an airplane, standing as tall as a giraffe, and still weigh less than some people I know. Some as dark pterosaurs were so big that they were at the very limit of whether they could fly, and many scientists are still convinced that all of them could. But the atmosphere isn't the issue, because the atmosphere of the Cretaceous was the same as it is today, minus all the smog, of course. Same with huge pre-flood dragonflies. Meganeura wasn't a dragonfly, it was actually a griffinfly a lineage that is now entirely extinct, like the vast majority of everything that has ever lived. How's that for an intelligent design? And contrary to popular belief, there were only a couple of terrestrial arthropods that reached extraordinary sizes, and they both lived in the Carboniferous period, long before the age of dinosaurs, when there was slightly more oxygen than there is today. But these couple families must have also had especially efficient oxygenation, better than all of the other bugs and such around them that were not especially big and were therefore evidently bound to the same limitations as they still are today. The fossil record is filled with giant creatures and plants. Hmm. You know why that is? Because there were no people around that. People tend to hunt for the biggest trophies, often throwing the little ones back. So the little ones live longer and reproduce more. And the fact that evolution is a thing that really works means the result is that the big ones get weeded out and only the small ones survive. So eventually you only have small ones left. That's why our game animals are getting progressively smaller. People keep killing elephants with big tusks, and pretty soon many of the remaining elephants don't even have tusks anymore. But if it wasn't for people always trying to dominate and subdue and destroy nature, if we weren't around, then being bigger usually meant being safer, stronger. Just imagine how out of place you would be if you took a time machine on a fishing trip and you become the bait. We know this because there are billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the world. Did you know there are billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth? I expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Like our children, they now are singing these songs and they'll never forget them. Billions of dead things buried in rock layers, <laughs> laid down by water all over the earth. And when we look at the dinosaur fossil record, we see that they were buried furiously, rapidly, and simultaneously, oftentimes found fleeing in groups. No, we don't ever find anything fleeing. How would we even know if they were? What we see instead is that some things get caught in minor calamities, like flash flooding river system, for example. Then their bodies get torn apart by scavengers who survived by not being in the valley at that moment. So we know that these events were not worldwide. They didn't kill everything. Take this massive bone bed in Hilda, Canada. Thousands of centrosaurs were catastrophically buried over an entire square mile. Apparently as a result of storm surge, as this area was on the shore of the Western Interior Seaway, which divided North America in half back when this happened 76 million years ago in the late Cretaceous. Or this one in China, where thousands of different kinds of dinosaurs were simultaneously buried in a single 980-foot long ravine. Because of an earthquake and resulting tsunami that happened 70 million years ago, 6 million years after the one in Hilda, Canada, and 4 million years before the impact that ended the age of the dinosaurs. That's why animals in this ravine are all Cretaceous species, without any modern exceptions. There are hundreds of dinosaur bone beds all over the world, including the U.S., where the Morrison Formation covers 13 states and 700,000 square miles. Ah, yes, the Morrison Formation, where all of the dinosaurs, crocodiles, turtles, and everything else were exclusively Jurassic species. Nothing from the Cretaceous and nothing from the Paleogene. And in one area, all these animals died in another localized inundation in a different place in a different time 145 million years ago. Not to be confused with the other things that were happening in the Cretaceous in different parts of the world at different times. Thousands of torn apart dinosaurs are buried here in hundreds of mass graves, with many found in the classic death pose with their necks arched back, choking as they died. Wrong again. As I have already explained a couple times earlier in the series, the so-called death pose is a condition caused by the fact that theropod dinosaurs have the same neck vertebrae as modern birds. 
because they are essentially the same thing. Such that it's easy for the head to fall or move back into that position when they're being jostled about some way after the animal has already died. And much harder for posthumous external forces like scavengers and such moving the body around to move it into the other direction. Museum signs everywhere even admit they died in a watery catastrophe. No, they don't. Not everywhere. In the Liaoning province of China, for example, there's another bone bed of dinosaurs and other Cretaceous species that were killed in and buried by a volcanic ash fall. No water necessary in that one. Some dinosaurs were even found mummified, with tree leaves, flowers, ferns, shrubs, and algae still in their stomach. Yes, and mummification requires long periods of pristine conditions not typically associated with catastrophes, and certainly not like what the global flood would have been if it could have actually happened. Dinosaurs are even found buried with marine creatures. Isn't a global flood the best explanation for this? No, the global flood isn't an explanation. It's a fable. It cannot account for any of the data we see in geology or paleontology, most of which directly contradicts the myth of Noah's Ark. Scientists have been discovering soft tissue in dinosaur bones. They describe blood cells, blood vessels, connective tissue, and even collagen, which has a maximum shelf life of about 900,000 years at 40 degrees. With a maximum shelf life of less than 1 million years, what's collagen doing in dinosaur bones that are supposedly 65 million years old? Mary Schweitzer, the Christian who discovered these tissues, says they're mostly finding the fossilized traces of blood cells and so on, not necessarily the original material. And she says that... Collagen is a real robust molecule. It kind of hangs out for a long time under normal circumstances. So in bone, it's orders of magnitude more lasting. Many dinosaur bones are even found unfossilized in places like Madagascar, Alaska, and Montana. That's not true either. Religious apologists, creationist propagandists really, want to give you the impression that dinosaur bones have been found in the same way we might happen across sun-bleached skeletons of some modern desert mammal. But that's never ever happened. Not even once. There are conditions under certain pressures and temperatures, chemical composition of surrounding sediment, where some fossils, especially large ones that are well insulated, could still include a few microscopic traces of original material, or at least the evidence of that original material. But that is very rare, and there has never been a single dinosaur fossil that was ever found unfossilized. Not even one. Ever. Whoever said that, because the credits of the Seven Myths program don't list an author or a narrator, whoever they are, they're not being honest. They're lying again, like they always do, like they have to, in order to defend the faith and make believe what they do. Does this evidence seem to support the Bible's recent and violent flood or evolution stories? The Bible is a compilation of stories, tall tales, in fact, because none of them are true. But evolution is not a story. It's an aspect of population genetics that is demonstrable, measurable. We use it in practical application throughout agriculture, livestock husbandry, infectious disease control, etc. But how can I expect people to understand that when they don't know what evolution is and they don't know what evidence is either? Because they said, Does this evidence seem to support the Bible's recent and violent flood? No, it doesn't. And arguments are not evidence. Evidence is a body of facts that indicate. A fact is a point of data that is objectively verifiable, where both sides can show that the data is indeed true before we begin to look at what the data implies. But each of the arguments from Genesis apologetics is just misunderstood, misinformation, misleadingly misrepresented, deliberately, deceptively. In every case, either the alleged fact isn't really true, which means it's not really a fact, or it doesn't indicate what they want it to. But that doesn't matter to those who don't care what the truth is and instead have a desperate emotional need to pretend.